I want to share uh, whatever I learned from these three sessions, not only with my family, but uh, I also do a little bit of uh, preaching in Melbourne. Uh, so therefore I thought uh, I can share what I learned here uh, with the uh, other devotees in Melbourne. Yes. I'm sorry to hear about the loss and especially you know, loss of losses itself painful, but if it's because of negligence and the guilt that comes with that, that can be especially traumatizing. In fact, uh, guilt is going to be one of the main themes we discuss in the second session, where we'll talk about uh, when Abhimanyu is killed in the Mahabharat, Yudhishthir feels guilty because he sent Abhimanyu into the chakra viewer. So how he dealt with that, we'll definitely be addressing. Grief involves a variety of emotions. There can be despair, there can be anger, there can be guilt. So <clears throat> we, will we will discuss those emotions also and how to process them in the second session. Thank you, Krishna Bro. Yes. Anyone else? Prabhu, I would like to share. Um, yes. Um, the, the, what interests me is that, um, again, um, I've, I've heard, seen some videos about grief and other things in YouTube. Um, um, again, family is fine there, but then you never know when you have to um, come to grief and, you know, uh, go through that process. But apart from that, um, as even individuals, we have a lot of baggage within us. So there is a lot of grief within. Uh, we are not able to let go from the past. So I'm expecting this session would uh, uh, help us understand the grief that is we are holding on uh, from a long time and is actually weighing on us so that we can release that or we can uh, get free from that. Yes. No, grief is a part of our universal human experience. It comes upon us sooner or later for various reasons. And how we can deal with that is, is a valuable, in fact, it's an indispensable resource to know. So yes, we'll discuss that. I think that is the point of Kavita Sud Mataji also on, on chat. Yes, maybe one more if anyone would like to speak. Uh, hi, Krishna. Hello, Krishna. Hi, Good Krishna. to see you. Um, yeah, well? actually, I, I don't have a specific reason. It's not that I have lost somebody close to me, but um, just this idea of growing growing through grief and as Nityananda Pran Prabhu was saying there's so many types of grief we experience through our life not just through death but also through when we have to move on we have to move to a new place we have to leave the place we're in or children my daughter's grown up and left so my life is different now and um, I was really attracted to coming just actually by the title that growing was there and I wanted to understand a little bit more about how grief works and how we actually use that to grow rather than get stuck in um you know trying to hold on to something that's gone now oh okay yes so we don't want to stay stuck we want to grow ahead from there that's very true definitely we'll be discussing that and uh, life is life is actually evolutionary we are all meant to evolve in our lives so how we do do we do that that's what we'll discuss. So thank you for sharing your thoughts. And uh, I'll be sharing a PowerPoint here, which will also be acting like a whiteboard. Sometimes I may type in the PowerPoint. But let's begin right now. So our topic is growing through grief. And within this, we are going to have three sessions. Okay. The first session is understanding grief. Second is processing grief. And the last session will be growing through outgrowing grief. So in this session, we will try to understand what we mean by this emotion of grief. As a part of that, we also try to understand emotions in general. And then we will talk about how emotions are to be addressed. Now, when we talk about grief, the word grief can come because of many reasons. 
it generally the word grief is associated with uh, with loss of some loved one some someone close to us but that but grief can also come because maybe a relationship ends not necessarily because somebody passes away but just there's a rupture in the relationship loss grief can also come because something dear to us is lost or destroyed grief but we will be focusing primarily on the grief that comes from loss of loved ones while and while grief is one very severe form of distress it's also representative of the nature of existence itself so in, let's look at this so now across the world there are many different uh, spiritual traditions there are many different paths there are many different philosophies uh, and while all these differences are there almost all the world spiritual traditions agree on one point and this point is something which most of us can also agree on that amid countless disagreements whatever we may have there's one agreement that life is tough that there is that life is not easy that even if somebody is comfortable in life right now they have had it tough they will have it tough in the future nobody's life story is actually a just a like a happy party everybody has some tragedy in their life sometime or the other so life is tough and this is actually a teaching of wisdom traditions across the world in the biblical tradition it is said that the world is a veil of tears in the buddhist tradition dukkha is called as the first noble truth in the vedic tradition in the bhagavad gita the world is called as dukkhalaya dukkhalaya is a place of distress now this this kind of negative declarations can seem very pessimistic very disheartening what does it imply now to understand what it implies that does it mean okay all of us have to be just live a miserable life because the world is a place of misery that's not exactly what it says that's not exactly what the implication is because here if you see let's take from the buddhist perspective it is said that this is a one of the four noble truths now we may wonder what if if it's a place of misery what's noble about misery so what is the, the world is a place of distress this is what does it mean is it like a dark pessimism and we are misery is inescapable so all of us are stuck for nothing but doom and despair or is it about realism that misery is probable and we can survive and thrive through it if we are prepared so let's look back at the gita and consider dukkhalaya dukkha means distress alaya means abode or place so literally it translates as place of distress by analogy we could use consider the word himalaya himalaya is the mountain peaks in northern india where there is a lot of snow and literally himalaya means hima is snow alaya means place of snow now when it is said himalayas the name himalayas it indicated it's a place of snow now is there snow only over there is there nothing else apart from snow well there are many other things there is himalayas are a place of magnificent scenery there are it's a place of resilient life forms flora and fauna and it can also be a place for incredible achievements where trekkers and mountaineers they go up and they climb on mount everest and they achieve something remarkable there so the point here is that when we say this is himalaya that doesn't mean that there's only distress only snow and nothing else but that there is snow sets a baseline expectation if somebody goes to the himalayas unprepared for the cold weather then they will suffer excruciatingly but once they accept the fact yes there is going to be 
it is going to be snow it's going to be extremely cold once they accept that and they prepare for that then there are many things that can be done in the himalayas the same way with the world the statement that this world is dukhalaya that it is a veil of tears that dukha is a defining characteristic of the world that is meant to set a baseline expectation that we need to be prepared for distress that doesn't mean that we are destined lifelong for nothing but distress so once we are prepared for distress just like we may be prepared for cold by using warm clothes then there are other things which we can do in our life so let's so the implication is not it's not pessimistic it's a realistic acknowledgement of how things are in the world having said that so this so is so this is the actual implication it's realism so now in general what happens is when we face the worst then we can prepare for the best if i know this this is more like a warning it is a if we know that this if somebody is traveling by a ship and they know it's stormy then they will ensure that they have sturdier ships it will ensure that they will have experienced captains so they will be prepared and earlier they might have traveled by flimsy ships they might have incom- incompetent crew but when we know that okay there is this is going to be a stormy this part of the sea is stormy that helps us prepare so when we talk about the distresses of the world among which grief is a prominent distress what happens is it is meant to prepare us so if we live in freezing weather once we know it is freezing then what happens it can it can spur us to progress how we may arrange for warmer clothes we can arrange for warmer homes warmer cars much of the technology that is developed in the world is because of the human aspiration to counter distress and to better deal with distress so if if somebody is lives in a very cold weather and denies that the weather is cold then they will not be able to do anything to deal with it effectively there will be no progress so when when it is said that the world is a place of distress that is a noble truth what does it mean it is ennobling accepting this truth that the world that the dukkha is a defining reality of the world it can transform us in a way that is noble it can actually bring about a healthy transformation within us and we humans so we prepare for distress broadly in two ways when we understand life is tough so what do we do we prepare for it by first is by means we gain outer resources so financial technological so if somebody knows that okay so maybe in the future the economy is going to go down okay then i have to have sa- prepare i have to have savings right now or the future is going to become very cold then i have to get uh, heat uh, heat for my room heating for my room so we prepare for the toughness of life by improving our outer resources that is means and this is to a large extent the domain of science but we also prepare for the toughness of life by improving our inner resources by inner resources what do we mean meaning so we humans are not just people who we are not just we want food air, air water shelter reproduction we are not just biological machines so we humans want meaning in life now if there is meaning then that can prepare us to face distress so none of us would like to experience pain mm-hmm. but say now in many parts of the world for the covid pandemic vaccination is happening now when the vaccination happens we are given a jab and sometimes there are some side effects because of that jab but if you understand we use our intelligence to understand okay this is a pain which will protect me from a bigger pain then that sense of meaning helps us to face difficulties so means are outer resources meaning is a inner resource now when a soldier goes to fight on the borders against a oppressive enemy who is attacking the soldier leaves the comforts of home of family of safety and goes on a war field now 
many may go just because it is their livelihood but there are quite a few who also go because that risk that sacrifice brings meaning to their life so in general for us to face suffering we use these two resources means and meaning so meaning means why is this happening why am i doing this what is going to result from this so that the world is a place of distress it's ennobling in the sense that it can lead us to find deeper meaning and you know how do we know nobility of a person when do we consider a person noble when they sacrifice for some higher cause is many people go for swimming that's just an enjoyable activity but if there's a stormy sea and somebody is drowning and then somebody jumps into the ocean to try to save that person that's a noble act of sacrifice it's a risk which somebody is taking so why do they do it because they consider saving a life of someone who is drowning more important then maybe even if it involves some little risk to their own life so the point i'm making here is that although none of us want suff- the want suffering in itself but what we really don't want is meaningless suffering if it's meaningful then we can voluntarily accept suffering so life's toughness life is going to be tough there are going to be problems in our life but if we can find meaning then that can help us to deal with problems so to put this diagrammatically the matrix of means and meaning that when we have to face problems so how do we face them we have means and then we have meaning so the best situation is where we have both means and meaning so then we are internally and externally empowered so <clears throat> somebody may be accustomed to be living living in moderate weather but say their family has some serious financial needs and they get a job in a place where it's frigid now they may go there and they may get a, get a house which is warm enough but still the cold is there so they have the means to count to counter the cold but then they also have meaning why am i come here i have come here to take care of to provide for my family's needs so when there is when we have both means and meaning that is the best way to deal with problems now on the other hand if we have means and no meaning then what happens is we have resources but we have no inspiration to use them in fact in modern and postmodern societies more and more we are finding ourselves in this situation sometimes in in some part, in remote parts of india you know, people commit say farmers for example may commit suicide because they just lack means to survive and they just can't deal with the problem now in the western world when people commit uh, suicide it is usually not because they have lack of means it is it is in the west relatively speaking there is a basic level of the basic needs are reasonably taken care of but quite often when people end their lives it's because they lack meaning feel there is so much suffering in my life and what is the point of all this why should i live just let me end it so to have means but no meaning is quite painful in the sense that uh, we just uh, lose our heart to do things now if there is no means and no meaning then that's simply agony it's multiplied more and more so now if somebody is say for example abducted somebody is abduct kidnapped and they are held hostage and they are tortured and they are starved and they are beaten and they don't even know why that is happening that's an especially agonizing thing if they know that okay you know because i belong to this group and this this group is against this group and they want to exchange hostages or they want to do this or they want to do that then, okay you make some sense about it and then you think about well, how, what can i get the means to do what is the means by which i can deal with this but if there's no means and no meaning it's extremely difficult to deal with it now if we have meaning but no means we know we, we have found some meaning in the suffering that we are having going through but we have no means to deal with it 
then it is possible to deal with it. We develop resilience by that, to endure the misery and emerge stronger. So, for example, in now some of you may be aware, there's a standoff between India and China uh, because of because of unresolved land disputes. So, one of my friends is in Siachen. Siachen is the highest battlefield front in India, in the world actually. So, he has been posted there for over a decade. Of course, not continuous posting comes and goes. So he says that you know, there's nothing we can do to change the temperature of the place. There is nothing that we can do to change the geopolitical situation. So, you know, we just have to stay there. So that as far as means are concerned, if there is aggression, we can counter it. But apart from that, it's like a, it's a place where you just have to stay with suffering. But it is, he says, my love for my country helps me to stay there. And he says, I have developed resilience. My body has become tougher. My will has become stronger. So what happens is, if there is meaning but no means, then we have to endure the misery, but we can emerge stronger through it because we become resilient. So in general, when we face distress, we try to find the means and the meaning. Of course, in general, first we try to find the means. So if I'm feeling pain, if I'm feeling my temperature rising, I might just take a paracetamol or combiflam and I try to get rid of this fever. But if it doesn't go away, then I investigate further. Okay, why is this happening? So generally, we try to look for means. And if means don't seem to work, then we try to look for deeper meaning. And then we try to come up with appropriate means again. So means and meaning are two resources which we use for dealing with distress. Now, we may face various distresses. Why am I discussing this? Because while we are, our topic is grief, see, while grief is a part of the distresses of life, but grief is also a distinctive part. It's in one sense different because when we face grief due to the loss of a loved one, that is a time there is no means to deal with it. At least in the sense that the person whom we have lost is lost forever. And there is no way we can gain them back. They are not going to come back to us. So in that sense, to deal with grief, we need to find meaning. Now, of course, we'll discuss about means to or how to address the situation specifically. But in terms of rectifying the loss, it's impossible. So there is a finality to death, which is irreversible, which is unappealable. And that's why for, for human beings, uh, death is so disorienting. Death can be so devastating because we are we usually resort to means for dealing with problems. Okay, this problem. Some people may say, you know, the, whatever problem is there, just throw enough money at the problem, it will get solved. Or if you have problems, you know, just find the right contacts, get the people with influence, you'll deal with the problems. So usually we look for means, but to face a situation where no means are going to fix the problem. That forces us to look for meaning. So grief, to deal, to, to deal with, why is grief, why can grief be so devastating, so overwhelming? Because of this, that there are no means to rectify the situation that has caused the grief. Of, uh, so now with this background, that uh, grief is a typical emotion in the sense that it is distressful, like many other distressful emotions. But grief is atypical in the sense that no means can be used to correct or reverse the situation that has caused the grief, the re reverse the loss. So this is the first point about grief. And any reflections or questions at this point? Okay. I see a few other comments also. Hmm. Now, how do you uh, find the meaning in grief? Of course, that's what we're going to discuss now. But in general, the question is that to deal with grief, we all need to find some kind of meaning in life. 
So let's move on. Now, before we can find meaning in, uh, before we can find meaning with, in grief, let's try to understand. Uh, so I started with the first Gita insight, that is, which is not a specific Gita insight; it's universal insight, that the world is characterized by distress. Now, to find meaning, the Gita urges us to expand our conception of being. To find meaning, we have to expand our conception of being. That means, who am I? So the Gita explains our existence is three level. That there is the body, the mind, and the soul. Now, from the body, from the soul is the source of consciousness. The soul is the source of our thinking ability. The mind is a source from which our attitudes, our dispositions, our thought patterns come about. And then the body is the place where we have our behavior. But essentially, we have these three levels of being. So our existence is not just physical. It's physical, emotional, and spiritual. And essentially, when death happens, basically, what is hap it's a, death is an event happening at a physical level. Hmm? But it has effects on the emotional level. So this is one way of looking at the three domains. But there's another way we can look at those same domains from perspective that here there's now in the earlier picture I had shown, sorry, in the earlier picture I had shown that death is, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So bo the body was the outermost covering the, and the soul was the innermost covering. Here, I have shown the body is the smaller smaller box. Then there's the mind and there's the soul. Now this is shown in terms of longevity. Longevity means that our body exists for our lifespan. But the Gita explains our mind extends over many lifespans. In fact, we at our core are spiritual beings and the soul goes from one body to another body. But the soul continues to exist. And along with the soul, the mind also exists. So our existence is three level, body, mind, and soul. And these three are distinct levels of existence. And understanding these three as distinct levels of existence is critical for understanding emotions in general and for understanding grief in particular. So here you see on the right side that there is a box which talks about the body as a box and there's a blow being hit on the body. That's a physical wound. And then here we see in the mind, there's again a blow, a crack that is happening. That is an emotional wound. So each of these areas of being can be affected. Now, say if somebody gets a physical injury, suppose they get fractured. Now, when they get a fracture, it's a real physical wound, it's a real wound. And it requires treatment. Now, some people, when they some people may have a low threshold for physical pain. And that's why when they have pain, they may they may scream, they may shriek, they may cry out and others may be much more stoic and they may grit their teeth and they may not utter a sound and they may they just endure the pain. Now these are two different reactions to the wound, to the fracture. Now whether one screams or one doesn't scream that is not as important as whether they actually Take the treatment. If I have a fracture, the important thing is that I get the fracture fixed, whether it's surgically or whatever is required for that. So when there is a physical wound, the reaction to the physical wound may vary from person to person. Some people may scream, some people may stay silent. But more important than the reaction is the treatment. What is the What am I doing to heal the wound? And the same principle applies to emotional wounds also. That 
when we face loss when somebody who has had a prominent place in our life a prominent place in our heart when we lose them that's like a severe injury or wound on our mind so it's a emotional wound and some people may cry a lot and some people may not shed any tears at all now the important thing is not whether we are shedding tears or not the important thing is whether we are actually going through the process of healing just as physical wounds need healing emotional wounds also need healing so now there are two ways in which we might have a reductionistic attitude toward grief so let's look at this sorry yeah hmm. so we may repress grief and we may say that there is no pain at all and we just stop all tears and we bury the grief inside us or we may express the grief and we may rage at others why did you let this happen or we may cry incessantly now both of these may be a part of our natural uh, the natural response of our particular psyche but the key thing is neither repressing nor expressing alone is going to heal what is going to heal is processing the grief processing the grief that means just like if i got a fracture whether i scream or don't scream is not going to heal the fracture what i do to treat it is going to heal the fracture so the point of this discussion is that grief is a emotional wound and it needs to be addressed appropriately so if what does it mean to address it properly so the first part was about find how to find meaning to deal with grief but before we can find meaning to deal with grief we have to understand what is grief itself so just like if i have a physical fracture then basically there are two broad phases in dealing with the fracture for so the first stage will be that okay stop if my hand is fractured the doctor will say okay stop moving your hand now we put it in a sling put it a cast around it and minimize or stop motion so that is the initial phase and maybe it is required for 15 days for 3 weeks for 4 weeks whatever it is and then after that doctor will say start moving the hand now maybe start start moving it start lifting some weight start putting some pressure on the hands now it may be that initially i may be a very active person and i might feel the fracture is not causing too much pain because some of the limbs have become deadened say so why do i keep it inactive i don't want to keep it inactive but i have to keep it inactive and after some time when i keep it active for a few weeks i may get habituated to that and i may feel it un- somewhat uncomfortable to start moving it but if i don't move it the limb will atrophy it will become weak and it may even die out so i need to activate it so both of these are phases now depending on the nature of the the ex- nature and extent of the injury depending on the how well a person is resilient or how well they heal the exact durations of how much to be inactive and how when to start resuming activity that may vary from person to person but that same principle of there being two phases applies for dealing with the emotional wound caused by grief also so what is that what is that two stages the first stage is that when there is a loss then there is we withdraw from normal life to process the grief what does it mean across the world most traditions have had some grieving rituals so in the vedic tradition sometimes there are like 12 or 13 or 10 day rituals and what is the purpose of that so that is the time when we put aside normal living and then we may be engaging in prayer we may perform some fire sacrifices we may go to some holy place to immerse the ashes no those are those may be seen by some as simply rituals which people who have particular of a particular who subscribe to a particular belief system do those rituals well that is a over simplistic way of looking at things these are time tested 
uh, and scripts scripturally described processes for dealing with grief so the idea is we withdraw from normal life and why because there has been a wound inside so one of the things that uh, one of the big problems when there is a sudden loss is that there is a lack of closure suddenly the relationship has ended so for people who know the significance of the last rites and they perform those last rites then what it helps them gain a sense of closure okay i did this for my for my deceased relative i did this i did this 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 so now in today's world depending on one's knowledge one's faith one's inclination the particular rites and rituals may or may not help a person to process grief so without i'm not going to go in this session in these sessions into the specifics of rites and rituals because we are focusing on the principles the principle is that across the world whether it is the vedic tradition whether it is the christian tradition whether it is the native american tradition there are after death there are certain practices given so the idea is withdraw from normal life and process the grief that's one part of the healing journey now there might be sometimes there are some memories where people who were no knew that deceased person deceased not deceased not that they have deceased but they have they no longer exist they, they cease to exist now so deceased so the deceased person people come together and remember that person and share the memories and those memories help in processing the grief help in the healing journey and then after that there is the resumption of normal interaction and functions gently gradually just like we do uh, we don't suddenly start if we had a fracture we don't lift a 30 kg suitcase the next day we start gently so there's a normal gentle resumption of daily activities so when dealing with grief there can be two ways in which one may go wrong some people may try to avoid this first step entirely they say nothing is wrong with me i everything is fine i just go on with normal life now now different people may need different durations of time for dealing with the grief but everybody needs to go through both the phases in general if we don't go through the first phase then that wound still remains inside and then what happens whenever that wound is triggered by something there is a over reaction so suppose say i have a shoulder sprain or a shoulder injury and i act as if everything is normal and i go about normal life and then some i i am talking with someone and somebody else wants to talk with me and in order to draw my attention they tap me on my shoulder and that's where i have a shoulder injury and ah, i scream or i may get angry and i may hit that person how dare you say what happened i just tapping you on the shoulder so but what happened is as it is a ordinary tap on the shoulder but i am not in an ordinary situation uh so the thing is that because i am not in an ordinary situation i will have an over reaction to an ordinary stimulus so if uh, how can we know whether we have not processed grief that you know if there are over reactions to certain stimuli now of course if something reminds us of somebody who is lost we may we may go into a flashback and we may remember and we may get lost a little bit that's fine that's understandable but if there are severe over reactions uh that means if we have lost someone and then we see some friend some relative some acquaintance who has that particular relationship that particular relative and then we start getting angry and lashing out at that person for no reason just because we are feeling a lost so that may happen so generally emotional over reactions are a indication of unprocessed grief that the first stage has been short uh, has been uh we try to take a shortcut out of the first phase now there is the other extreme also the other extreme would be that a person stays stuck in the first stage and never comes out of it and that is what the bhagavad gita calls as lamenting see grieving is an essential part of healing but when the bhagavad gita talks about lamenting don't lament 
so lamentation means that like somebody uh, it's the phys it, that, to give a physical example somebody had a fracture and their hand is in a sling and they refuse to take their hand out of the sling at any time at all for the rest of the life they just want to stay keep their hand in the sling so like that some people when they they lose someone and they grieve for it but then they keep living out and replaying in their minds the same set of events and it goes on for not only for days or weeks or but months and years so they never come out of it and that is unhealthy so we need in the journey toward healing we need to go through both the phases the first and the second so the first is where we withdraw and we process the grief and the second is where we resume normal functions so how much time who will need that will vary from person to person their own nature the nature of their relationship with the person who was lost and the kind of emotions that were invested in the events around that loss so that will vary but in general the principle is both have to be dealt with so uh, having said this that so grief the point which i'm making is just like the body is a real body is a reality the mind is also a reality and just as physical wound need to be practically addressed emotional emotional wound need to be practically addressed so we may have if we don't understand grief properly there may be two ways in which sorry yeah there may be reductionism of grief reductionism means earlier i talked about the uh, so express repress and process that is a way of handling grief but this is i am talking about misconceiving misunderstanding grief itself we may reduce grief to something it is not so nowadays there is a tendency to pathologize human emotions so <clears throat> there are some psychologists and psychiatrists who decide to say that say if somebody after a loss grieves keeps grieving beyond say 2 weeks then they declare grief to be a pathology a brain pathology and it needs medical treatment now on what basis do we say that 2 weeks is the time 2 weeks is the right time for healing well different people may have different uh, kinds of relationship different kinds of losses so you remember i talked about the three levels the body the mind and the soul so reductionism so this kind of reductionism scientific reductionism is we in mainstream science the mind and soul today are not the mind is not very clearly understood and the soul is not understood at all so what happens is grief is reduced to simply the physical level why are you grieving because there's something wrong in your brain and we'll give some pills they will trigger some some uh, some enzymes some some enzymes in your brain and you will feel better well that is over simplistic we cannot have biological solutions or chemical solutions to human problems we cannot have chemical solutions to human problems we there, there are, as human beings in the human condition we all face challenges and those challenges can't be solved simply by popping a pill so to reduce to treat grief as a pathology of the brain that is one kind of reductionism where we reduce the human reality to simply the physical level our existence is three level body mind and soul but instead of considering the wound at the level of the mind we just say that it's a at the level of the body uh, at the level of the brain and we try to deal with that so it doesn't work uh, now some cases if there are other symptoms also just like if there's depression that can depression be treated by medication well sometimes there is clinical depression and that requires medication but if a person has lost a job if a person's marriage has fallen apart if a person has uh, lonely if a person is addicted to bad habits the, and then they are depressed well popping a few pills is not going to remove the, the depressing situation in their life they have to make also lifestyle changes to deal with their unhealthy habits to develop healthier relationships to 
have a viable viable job something like that so we can't reduce human problems to brain pathologies and solve them so this is one kind of reductionism it is quite common in circles where psychiatry and psychology have a lot of influence and this is where reality is reduced to the body now unfortunately in spiritual circles uh, there can be another kind of reductionism so our existence presently is a three level body mind and soul so sometimes our existence may be reduced only to the level of the soul and the idea would be that don't you understand that the soul is eternal why are you lamenting the loss of the body you're just being sentimental you're just being attached don't be so attached well that that is not going to work why not because yes my ultimate my foundational identity is spiritual but my present existence is physical emotional mental and spiritual so if i have got a fracture let's go back to the physical counterpart if I, if i got a fracture and somebody says why are you worrying about the fracture you know you know that you are not the body or the soul well yes i know that my i am my essential identity is spiritual but still i need the body to function if the body is fractured i can't function so i need to do what it takes to heal the physical fracture so similarly when there is a emotional rupture in our lives which may be caused by grief which will be caused by loss coming loss and the grief that it results in that's a real wound so we need to avoid both forms of reductionism the reductionism which reduces our human experience to the level of only the body or the brain or the reductionism that reduces our human experience to only the level of the soul and rejects everything else but the holistic understanding of the human experience is that 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 our existence is three level body mind and soul and when there is a emotional wound it needs to be dealt with appropriately and this is seen in the bhagavad gita itself the bhagavad gita is a book that is spoken uh, you could say the bhagavad gita is in some ways a grief narrative why a grief narrative because arjuna he came ready to fight the war but when he was about to fight the war he came in the middle of the two armies and he saw and on the other side not just his enemies not just the supporters of his enemies he saw there were his venerable elders there was his grand sire there was his martial teacher and he couldn't deal with that grief how can how will i live after their death not to speak of i becoming the cause of their death i can't process this so that's where the gita's wisdom help him to deal with the situation so now in the gita krishna does say rajuna that those who, uh, who those who think of life and death only in terms of the body and they think that death means end of existence they are ignorant they are ignorant and Uh, the their lamentation is a is a sign of their ignorance at the same time now the the bhagavad gita is a part of the mahabharat and the bhagavad gita was spoken just before a massive war took place so the bhagavad gita has 18 chapters and the war also was fought for 18 days now in in the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita krishna tells arjuna that those who are on in knowledge they are not attached they they don't lament for worldly things like putra dar griha adishu aratir jana samsadi so he says he says that a person like this is that a person is detached from from one's family from one's son from one's spouse so in the 13th chapter krishna says that and yet on the 13th day of the kurukshetra war arjuna loses his son abhimanyu is killed in a uh, by a brutal conspiracy by the opponent opponent kauravas and then there is a whole chapter which describes arjuna's agony at that time arjuna's grief 
and krishna the same krishna who is told earlier that don't lament the inevitable change of life from change change of soul from one body to another from one life to another that those in knowledge do not lament krishna does not speak the same philosophy krishna doesn't sell arjuna you know why are you being ignorant why are you being sentimental did you forget the bhagavad gita that i told you no arjuna's resp- krishna's response to arjuna's grief is is very sensitive very holistic very empathic so that means there is the philosophy to be understood but then there is the how we live the philosophy now if somebody has lost a loved one and we we tell them we just start speaking philosophy to them saying that you know actually you know we all relationships are temporary we are not the body we are the souls we are the soul you know we may come off as very hard hearted we may come off as very insensitive now we may say i'm not being hard hearted i'm not being insensitive i'm simply detached you know i'm just grounded in reality oh but what we may think of as detached may actually come off as hard hearted and we may even be hard hearted so when somebody is grieving our purpose is not just to krishna i, I will talk about krishna's example and how krishna responded to arjuna's grief shortly but the essential principle is that our purpose is not simply to teach philosophy to somebody who is grieving our purpose if somebody is grieving our purpose is to assist them to help them to serve them and as a part of our assistance to them philosophy can be one resource but it is not the only resource a person may need emotional support at that time a person may need practical assistance at that time so whatever way we can assist them that we assist them so if we have that balanced attitude then we can actually be of service in a very valuable way so let's move to the last part now where i discuss about um, about how krishna consoled arjuna after the death of abhimanyu so the, this incident actually happened on the 13th day and on that day arjuna was sidetracked by the opponents one regiment of the opponents headed by the generals called trigartas and they what they did was they diverted arjuna to a separate place separate part of the battlefield and in the main battlefield they formed a, a military formation called chakravyuha and there they trapped abhimanyu and abhimanyu was killed and that evening when arjuna came back you know he had a wide variety of emotions you know his emotions initially he felt fear then he felt despair he felt horror he felt guilt he felt anger and then finally he came to determination so in one sense we could say that it for arjuna the various phases of the grief the first four were like withdrawal and then was the reengagement where was the determination the next day he tried that those who had caused a human news death will have to be held accountable so now when arjuna came back that evening arjuna came back from the war field and he started observing he says why is there no celebratory music as i return every day when the warriors would come back there would be welcoming it's like a, because the warriors had fought and won some wars won some defeated made some won some battles so there would be a mood of celebration but on this day there was a somber silence and then he said why are these soldiers avoiding eye contact with me as he was returning nobody was everybody was looking away from him and then why do i have this bad feeling inside me is something wrong a war is a is a place of immense noise and distraction so right now we are hearing this we are having this talk i am speaking you are trying to hear most of us we are trying to avoid distractions if right now say if somebody was five people others were speaking in this room where i am speaking it would be difficult for me to speak also 
and say five people are speaking in the room where you are hearing it would be difficult for you to hear so generally there a lot of concentration is required for us to understand knowledge now in a war also the warriors have to be attentive okay this enemy is attacking me from here and i have to fight but the war is not a distraction free zone there are so many other fights going on over there maybe this was the soldier is screaming this that soldier is shouting there there are so many noises going on and the warriors have to shut out all that all that other noise and focus on the person they are fighting with while of course they have to be alert still a part of them has to be alert is somebody going to ambush and attack me in those times generally there would be no ambush attacks warriors would it was a test of skill and they would attack a person who was prepared for fighting so as arjuna was thinking why do i have this bad feeling he suddenly remembered while he had been fighting with the opponents somebody had saw, called out hey drona is forming the chakra view at that time because he had been in the heat of the fight he hadn't it hadn't registered with him he started thinking if drona had formed a chakra view then no one except me knew how to break it yes abhiman knew knew how to break it but he didn't know how to come out of it after going inside so did abhiman knew go inside the chakra view did anything happen to him is that why there is such a somber atmosphere here so then as arjuna entered into the assembly hall the temporary assembly hall that had been built on the war field at the edge of the war field there all the warriors would sit uh, before the start of the war in the morning or at the end of the war at the, at the end of the day at the end of the day uh, and they would discuss so every warrior had their own throne so arjuna entered and his eyes first went straight to the throne of abhimanyu and that throne was empty his heart almost stopped beating at that time he looked around all the other warriors were there and he looked at his brother yudhishthir looked at his brother bhima and their faces were crestfallen there was signs of tears flowing having flown down their eyes and he realized that his worst fear has come true that abhimanyu is no more then he went through anger his anger was directed to his brothers primarily he says he is lashing out of them he says how could you let my son die all of you say that you are great warriors but are your weapons just bangles are they just for show how could you not save my son as he was lashing out he actually turned out and lashed at krishna also says krishna you must have known what was happening why didn't you tell me now when we also may go through these kind of emotions sometimes there is fear then there is anger why did this happen why did you let this happen sometimes we may be even angry at god and we will discuss in the future session how you know god is big enough to accommodate even our anger but there is anger at this point and then there was despair there is a despair accompanied by a sense of guilt he said what is the use of my archery skills i am supposed to be the greatest archer in the world i can defeat any enemy but if i can't save my own son what is the use of all the years that i practice archery what is the use of all my past victories he started thinking that maybe when abhimanyu was all alone and outnumbered when abhimanyu yudhishthir told the incidents how they had happened yudhishthir himself was especially agonized because of what had happened that we will discuss in the next session but as arjuna heard this he could visualize his son alone surrounded by almost ocean of kaurav warriors all charging towards him he said that surely at that time abhimanyu must have called out to me hoping that i would come and rescue him i would come to his aid and how shattered he must have been when he realized that nobody was going to come to help him that he had to die alone that his son who would sleep on comfortable beds in royal palaces 
was now lying on the cold ground on the water war field so he started he started feeling despair guilt and then it was thinking how will i face subhadra and tell her that her 16 year old son who had out of enthusiasm wanted to fight in the war and whom i had agreed to fight assuring that i would protect her how will i tell her that i failed to protect him so these were all emotions that arjuna was going through and, and finally as his despair started overpowering arjuna just collapsed on the ground immobilized no krishna came up to arjuna and krishna put a arm around krishna arjuna's shoulder and pulled him into a embrace and spoke words to comfort him to console him to so to strengthen him now what words krishna spoke and how they help arjuna recover that we will discuss in a future session the focus of this session was to understand that grief is a real emotion and it needs to be acknowledged not dismissed away so when arjuna was venting his grief krishna didn't try to suppress his grief by speaking philosophy to him krishna didn't try to squelch his grief by telling him don't be sentimental don't be, be manly don't cry like this don't break down like this why because it is a wound which needs to be dealt with appropriately so our session i'll summarize what we discussed today and we can have some question answers mm, our topic today was we are discussing about growing through grief and we discussed the first session understanding grief so in understanding grief uh, i talked today about broadly three themes the first theme was that when we talk when we are talking about grief it is a both a typical and a atypical distress that the world is a place of distress is a universal truth talked about by various wisdom traditions and that does that is not meant to be pessimistic con, con, that means we are condemned to realistic to prepare us so that when distress comes we we know how to deal with it it's an ennobling truth in the sense that knowing that distress is likely to be there we do two things to deal with distress we acquire external means and we seek inner meaning and while both of these are required death can be especially the gr- grief that comes because of death of a loved one is especially disorienting because there is no means that can deal with it that can rectify the situation take it back to the earlier situation that's why we need to find meaning to deal with grief now of course the uh, best way to deal with distress would be to have means and meaning both but if we have if we don't have either then we simply make ourselves more and more miserable if we have means but no meaning then uh, because of we may know what we may have the resources but we lack the more inspiration to act if we have the meaning but no means then we can develop resilience and we can survive through the situation so before we can find meaning in grief so the first point was that we need to find meaning to deal with grief the second point was before we can find meaning in grief we need to understand what grief is all about so for that i discussed the three levels of existence physical mental and spiritual and grief caused by the loss of a loved one is like a wound on the emotional level so just as a physical fracture needs to be dealt with appropriately independent of whether a person screams or not so similarly emotional wounds need to be dealt with appropriately irrespective of whether one cries or doesn't cry there has to be the process, progress toward healing and then <clears throat> i talked about just as physical fracture there are two stages in the healing one is we reduce mobility and say keep the hand in the sling and then after that we resume normal activity so same way to deal with grief we need to first withdraw from our normal activities and address the issues that arise from the grief and then after that gradually gently we resume our normal activities 
So if we don't do the first, and we just act as if nothing has happened, then we will overreact to small things that trigger our emotional wounds. And if we stay stuck in the first and never progress to the second, then we will go on grieving, and that that kind of grieving leads to is called lamenting. It just stays on. We we don't move on from that situation. So we talked about dealing with grief. We don't want to simply ex. The point is not to repress. The point is not to express, but to process so that we heal. And while processing, we need to avoid two kinds of reductionisms. One is we reduce brain uh, grief to only the physical level that it is a brain pathology. So on the other hand, the other extreme could be that we reduce it to a, a philosophically that so we rather reduce our experience, our human existence. to only the physical level and deny the emotional wounds or reduce our existence to the spiritual level and say why are you just being sentimental so one approach is just learn the philosophy and stop being sentimental the other approach is that okay just take some pills and it will go away neither approach will work sustainably because the wounds at the emotional level need to be dealt with appropriately so and they talked about how the reality and the gravity of grief Or that I talked about two things. The Bhagavad Gita itself is a grief narrative. So Arjuna faced the gruesome prospect of the death of his loved ones, and Krishna gave him wisdom by which he could face that. But the wisdom was not simply that. Okay, you remember this philosophy and forget everything else. Krishna, when the same wisdom that Krishna gave in the thirteenth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna didn't remind Arjuna on the thirteenth day. Didn't throw it at him. when he lost his son a krishna allowed arjuna to went out when he was grieving and then only after that he spoke some wisdom as a part of the his his way of assisting arjuna so when somebody is grieving we 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 don't see philosophy as the immediate and complete solution to the problem rather we see that we are meant to assist them when they are grieving and philosophy can be one resource for assisting them and there can be uh, there can be just our emotional support we can offer them we can practical assistance we can offer them whatever it is if our attitude is to assist them to serve them then we will be we will be able to help them grow through the grief also so thank you very much hare krishna are there any questions or comments okay so there's a question here by kavita uh, sud mata ji does our soul grieve after it leaves the body where it was sheltered for so long if yes how does it get solace and after how much time who consoles it okay there are two ways to look at this okay i think we need to mute everyone okay so mm-hmm. and the question was that the soul grieve <clears throat> the soul the mind and the body they together comprise embodied existence right now and we could say that the soul soul's energy is consciousness and the consciousness is projected into the world through the mind so at present the soul doesn't experience anything apart from whatever is experienced through the body and the mind so to give another an example illustrated say somebody is sitting in a movie theater and they are watching a horror movie so now around them there are people maybe they have their family next to them yeah then maybe a child is watching a horror movie the mother is sitting next to them that child but the child is so caught in the horror movie that the child is not even aware that there is anyone next to them child may go through all kinds of emotions fear horror terror as they watching the horror movie the consciousness is caught over there 
so when as long as the consciousness is caught over there now is the is the child in danger well we can say if there's a shape shifting monster on the screen who is killing every, devouring everyone the child might be trembling now is the child in danger well, not in physical danger but is the child experiencing those emotions yes the child is experiencing those emotions so so from one perspective the soul is unaffected by anything that happens at the physical or the emotional levels because the soul is existing separate from it all anaditva nirgunatvat parmatma yam avyaya sharirasthopi kaunteya na karoti na lipyate in the bhagavad gita 13th chapter it is said that the soul is completely detached from everything at the level of the body and the mind because the soul is separate at the same time while the soul's existence is not threatened just like the child who is watching the movie there exist the child's existence is not threatened but the child's emotions go through a wide variety of uh, wide gamut of all kinds of negative emotions so similarly for the soul also so we could say essentially the soul doesn't grieve but functionally because the soul's consciousness is caught in the body so the soul does grieve and the solution to that is usually is that uh, the soul needs some kind of closure so that's why in the vedic tradition uh, there is cremation when a person dies their body is cremated now cremation can for some people seem a little too too graphic or even barbaric how do you just burn a body like that but the point is that for everyone for those uh, surviving relatives as well as the soul who has departed that the burning of the body conveys in a very graphic way the irreversible finality of what has happened that there is no chance of returning into this body now there is no chance of uh, continuing life where it was so then the soul can move on so does the soul grieve yes it does in the sense that the body which was its place of existence for so long is being is no longer functional it has been evicted from the body but in general the soul can move ahead when there is closure and certain last rites can help in closure now of course it's not just burning the body but also there are other prayers and rituals which are offered uh, which can also help the soul to toward a better destination so how does it get solace we'll talk about um, we will talk about that in the next session um, th- there is an aspect of god who is always present with us within our hearts that is called the paramatma or the super soul and he guides the soul to the next journey of course we if that soul was related that person was related to us if we perf- if we offer some prayers and and uh, we we we, of- we pray and we offer the fruits of those prayers and those devotional acts to the deceased soul that's also one way they can be benefited okay thank you hari krishna would there are a couple of devotees who have asked the question like manibhushta mata ji has asked uh, emotional stages after the loss you mentioned talking about someone who has gone and recollecting memories and will help to heal the grief how you yeah, answer the question yeah however i have found that it makes me go more in depth of grief please clarify how can that stage help me not to lament and still remember the person thank you hari krishna okay so i talked about how memories can help in healing but is the mem- if remembering the person actually makes me go deeper into the grief yes that is also possibilities see with respect to the mind uh, each mind is an indiv- is individual and we can't have a formula for one formula that is going to work for all minds one of the adjectives that krishna uses in the bhagavad gita is the mind is chanchala chanchala means restless but chanchala also means that it is like a child now if you if you have dealt with children you know we all know that we can't use one formula for all children each child is an individual and when a child is crying some child children may be pacified by is comforting and fondling some children may be given toys some children may be given some food 
child. So, and the same child may need different things at different times. So, all that we can do is have a variety of resources and see which resource helps us to deal with something. So, it's not a one size fit all formula, but in general, how remembering the person can help us to move on from the grief is that not only do we remember the person, but we also remember that person in relationship with what they meant for us and what they wanted us to do. So if you remember it from that perspective, not just that they were that their presence was so enriching for us, so valuable for us and we have lost them, but yes, in their loss, how would they want me to live? So we, we can remember many things about them, but we highlight those memories. Those memories where you know, we understand that they, we have a legacy to, that we, we have a legacy to carry out on their behalf. For me, uh, one of the reasons I started off on my spiritual journey was, or at least my spiritual quest, you could say, not a journey, was because when I was in my 10th, I lost my mother to blood cancer and it was just one month she was diagnosed and it was all over. At that time, my father was working in a different city and our younger brother who was almost 10, 11 years younger to me, just four at that time. So it was very difficult to process that. But then one of the memories that helped me to move ahead was that my, when my younger brother was born, my mother told me, now you have become a big brother. It is your responsibility to take care of your, this baby. If I'm not there, you have to watch him the way I watch him. So that's what inspired me in some ways right, to take, take care of my, my younger brother and move on. So we need to zero in on those memories which, uh, which help us to think of how the person who has departed would want us to live. Would they just want us to live on in grieving? Of course, we could say that they, they wouldn't want us to forget us completely. That is true. But they wouldn't want us to live in the past forever. So actually, I also do seminars on journaling. And we've done three seminars till now. Journaling, journal, journaling as the yoga of writing, journaling for self-transformation. And just yesterday we completed journaling for better study of scriptures. So from next week, starting a seminar on journaling to, tran to make our memory our treasury. So there we want to talk about processing different memories. So writing down our memories and then writing down our, both our painful memories, our joyful memories, and then processing them. That's one way to deal with it. But in general, just the remembrance is not just for the sake of remembrance. We want remembrance to get some direction in our life. And if we focus on those remembrances, then definitely we can move ahead. Thank you. Yes. I think I answered that. Okay. Then uh, there's a comment from Krishtangi. Is the mourning is the process then? So, I, don't know, I, mean, I think you already answered that. Uh, Nitanta Pranam has a question. Yeah, is mourning the process part of the process? Yes, there is. Morning rituals are there, and uh, or morning practice, morning practices are there. What we do within them is important. You know how we individually address those issues. That's what is key. Yes, Nitin Pranpro. Oh, Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Um, really like the slide where you put that uh, for grief. The you can't put it as a, a pathology or, or you, you or philosophically you can't do it as a sentimental uh, expression, but it needs to be processed. Uh, my question is, um, that's where grief counseling comes in, but most devotees don't access to grief, grief counseling. They want to um, express their grief within the devotee community. Uh, but uh, also there's a pitfall, like if somebody's not skilled enough, they might not be able to support them. So when you're trying to process your grief through by sharing it with another devotee, what are the qualities that you need to look from the other devotee that he's actually... Um, Equipped or like you know he's he's in a position to help me process my grief. Okay. So I would say, <clears throat> who is mature enough to process that grief? 
in general the most important uh, quality would be empathy and mature quality would be empathy and maturity empathy means that they are able to understand other person's emotions and uh, that means they let the other person speak if the other person wants silence they give them silence but they try to tune into the other person and uh, now grief counseling is itself a specialized field and i don't know whether uh, in general a devotee would need specifically to go to a professionally trained grief counselor but what would be needed is at a basic level an acknowledgement of the grief acknowledgement of the loss and some empathetic empathic support for dealing with the loss so once that is provided then it is possible so but in whether it is a devotee or whether it is a professional generally devotees also have some philosophical knowledge which can help in the growth so that's preferable but empathy to understand what the other person is going through it's sometimes as devotees we are so sure that we know the prescription that we don't even spend we think that we don't even have to diagnose so a prescription prescribing without diagnosing can be quite uh, detrimental even if we are giving the right description also we may not have earned the trust of the person whom we are trying to help so diagnosing means we let, let them speak and we hear them speak so one thing is empathy to be actually able to understand where the person is coming from and then maturity maturity means that a person doesn't get themselves too overwhelmed or carried away by the emotions the person can stay emotional they're empathic but they stay stable they stay grounded and they help the other person to recover now in, in the next session and the session after that we'll be discussing about how say how krishna counseled arjuna how when yudhishthir felt guilty after the death of abhimanyu how vyasadev counseled him and the wisdom is an important resource but emotional support can also be a resource practical assistance can also be a resource but i would say empathy and maturity are two important characteristics okay thank you okay so when a does their soul also hear and feel pain because even if they have gone to a new body they may not have developed attachment to that body in general the post mortem journey post mortem means after death generally use our post mortem for the operation that is done to investigate the cause of death but post mortem basically means after death so the post mortem journey of the soul means after the soul has departed from this world uh, what, or from this life specifically what happens to the soul is it is very individual because it that journey is also determined by one's individual karma so the soul may immediately go to a next body the soul may go through some other place and some other domain before they get another species they get body in another species whatever we don't know now in general the journey is irreversible so the garuda puran describes one possible trajectory but that's not as with the only trajectory that the soul may take so there are so oh, but whether that soul will remember the previous body and uh, feel distress because of that it's only that soul is somehow uh, stuck in the vicinity because of some karma because of being in a disembodied form so in that case the soul may stay stuck but generally for most people <coughs> death and the subsequent journey are are quite a severe experience and they are so so disorienting in some ways that most memory gets wiped out and that's why most people don't remember their previous lives a few people remember very very few people and that is usually because uh, because they had didn't have a closure that means children who died suddenly i have written a book on this topic of demystifying reincarnation there are almost 25 or more cases of 
children remember their past lives so after that i wrote that book i did some further research on the topic and i found that these children at that time when they are 3 4 5 they are desperate i want to go to the mummy mummy i want to go to my other mummy they be desperate and they want to go there they meet their other family but once they do that they get a sense of closure most of these kids who remember their previous lives have had unexpected and violent deaths maybe accident maybe a maybe a murderous attack maybe a whatever it is so they couldn't they couldn't get the closure so when they get the closure then as they grow older they may still remember their that oh in my childhood i used to remember my previous life but there is no emotional intensity to that remembrance it is because the wound has healed you know if say i have got a wound and the wound is still raw and if i just touch it also it causes a lot of pain but if the wound is healed then even if i touch that area there's no effect so for them it's then it's just a informational memory it's not a emotional memory so in some cases there might be remembrance of a previous life but remembrance of the of the pain that the members of a previous life are going through i haven't seen any scriptural or empirical account of that because the soul would also require some paranormal abilities to be able to perceive what is happening far away from where it is so it's unlike that's that's an unlikely possibility that the soul will remember and feel the pain of those who have deceased now of course sometimes in some local traditions uh it that kind of statement might be made that you know don't cry because you know that person whom for you crying they will also feel bad because you are crying so we understand the intent behind those statements and we appreciate that intent but it may not be grounded in philosophical reality okay i think we will have two last questions and then we'll end yes Rima and Shreyasi Mata ji. Hare Krishna, Prabhu ji. Dhan Patna. Dhan Dhanavat. I just wanted to check: uh, Will we be discussing about how to move on from initial stage of grief to eventual, so that we are not stuck in that lamenting of phase? Of course, of course. That's the whole point of processing and outgrowing. The next two sessions. Today, the focus was on that understanding the reality and gravity of grief. Yes, definitely. The next sessions are going to deal with that. Okay, thank you, Prabhu. Yeah, thank you. Yes, go in, Hari Prabhu. Um, Hare Krishna, Prabhu Randavat. Thank yeah. you for the, the wonderful class. My my question was, it's again based on uh, uh, curiosity. It you, you gave us the example of uh, Abhimanyu and how Arjun is trying to process the grief of losing Abhimanyu and the various stages. um uh, in the other vedic epic the ramayan is the example of dashrath maharaj and the grief he kind of has to endure when uh, lord ram has to go to the forest and he holds himself accountable for that uh, predicament and and the grief is so great that he pretty much uh, leaves his body as devotees we understand that it's a it's a glorious departure but from a but from a uh, from a you know a third party point of view reading the ramayana it seems almost very ghastly that uh, there's this personality who's very noble like dashrath maharaj is a very noble personality and he's just playing a role where he as a kshatriya he's agreeing to certain promises he made at, at a point in time and he's being manipulated into letting go of uh, you know shri ram into the forest so how do you how do we reconcile that grief and uh, that that was just the question yeah it's a big question and i think uh we will can we discuss this in the next session because next mm-hmm. time we'll talk about destiny and karma yeah sure and that will help us to understand uh, how uh, what how various situations come in our life so if after the next session this question you feel is no longer uh, not yet answered we can raise it once again okay thank you okay. So thank you very much for all of you for your thoughtful participation, and uh, we'll dis- we'll join next Saturday for discussing about processing grief. Today we discuss about understanding. We'll talk about processing. Thank you very much. Mr. Prabhupada ki jai. Aur Bhagwan ki jai. Hare Krishna.
His grace has been children Prabhu ki jai. Aur ke mande. Thank you.